Bibles up to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. This is part two of a message called, The Righteous Scarcely Be Saved. If the righteous scarcely be saved. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's word. Part two, and I'm going to try to go right through this, beloved, so pay attention, because Peter makes a very serious and a very sober statement here that most Christians and most churches just pass right over. They just overlook. And when he says, if the righteous scarcely be saved, that ought to tweak our ears. What do you think? Okay, we, we know there's nothing wrong with the atonement, and we talked about that last week, so I won't go into that. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. Peter says, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. If the righteous scarcely be saved, part two, let's go to the throne of grace. Father in heaven, we pray that you'd be here this morning and anoint this preacher, Father. Anoint the word of God. Open up the hearts of each and every person that's here today. Those who watch by TV or YouTube or CD, DVD, whatever it is, Lord God, anoint it and bless them with it. We ask it in the Christ's name with mercy and thanksgiving. And Father, we ask it with power. Amen. And you may be seated. Well, last week we learned... That the phrase in verse 18, if the righteous scarcely be saved, molesodzo is that Greek phrase. It means that the righteous are not easily saved. And we saw that if they're being saved with great and extreme difficulty, beloved, because of the intense spiritual battle that we're in, then the impenitent and the ungodly who constantly and continuously disbelieves and he defies God and he does, uh, disobeys God and the gospel of God, beloved, he doesn't have a chance of ever being saved. Now, a lot of people like to think my uncle, my father, my brother, my sister are good people. God says if they're not saved, they don't have a chance of grace in God's doors. Remember, the only thing that washes your sin away is the precious, sinless, shameless, guiltless, blameless, crimson blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not your good deeds. All that's going to do is get you less stripes in hell. But that's where you'll end up if you don't get saved. And so we need to understand that. So we learn, beloved, that positionally in heaven, God has justified us. But personally on earth, he's yet fully sanctify us, and we're still sinful, beloved. So, in order for God to make our personal state on earth to now match our personal status in heaven, God begins to daily be about the business of consecrating us. Why does he do that? So we can become the holy and righteous, godly people that he planned for from the foundation of the world that are conformed and transformed into the image of Christ. Come on and say amen out there. Now, beloved, therefore, God uses all of the circumstances of our life, good, bad, and indifferent. He uses them as a divine laboratory, whereby he now morally and spiritually refines us, and he reforms our life to correct perfect, and to protect our faith, protect our salvation. And God does this to ensure that we'll ultimately grace the doors of his heaven in the end. Because when we got saved, we just entered the race, and it's a marathon. It's a long race, isn't it? But beloved, we're totally dependent upon God. I told you, him working in us, with us, and through us. But he wants to make sure that we understand that we're also to be counterculture from this world. You cannot, you must not, Play with this world and think you're going to go to glory. Remember, we have to be counterculture, and Peter deals with some of these things right here. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? God wants us to receive that full and final salvation. As we saw in 1 Peter 1, 4, he wants us to inherit that incorruptible, undefiled spiritual inheritance. And he said, it has your name on it. I already gave it to you. The day you got saved, I put your name on it. It's reserved up in heaven for you. Now I want you to persevere and endure in the faith, and it's yours. Come on and say amen. amen. Praise the Lord, we have some kind of inheritance, because most of us on this earth aren't going to get any. <laughs> okay. But, beloved, we learned also that God's chastening, God's correcting, God's consecrating process in our life can be 
very laborious, and consequently, it can be very painful because he often lets us suffer. He lets us reap the hurtful consequences of the bad and wrong things we've done, and we, he's done this, beloved, so he can uh, uh, toughen us up, toughen our faith, teach our faith, beloved. You know, so many people just throw the towel in so easy, but you, I, I, uh, you, you don't Build a muscle, remember, unless you first rip up the fibers and tear it down. And then your body goes into a state of, of catabolism and anabolism and starts rebuilding the muscle. Which is the same thing spiritually. God wants to spiritually rebuild our, our muscles. Because we need that. Otherwise, we'll throw the towel in. Moreover, beloved, he also allows, he sends many distressing adversities and afflictions to purge and purify us to keep us on track for heaven. I'm saying this, I'm saying that the hammer and anvil, the heat of God's furnace of affliction, is very painful and hot, but it's absolutely necessary. It is no fun. But every person who names the name of Christ is going to go into that furnace. I've been there many times and in it now. Everybody goes through the furnace of affliction. That's the hammer and the anvil. And God does that in our life because remember, you may forget about it, but he's busy about the business getting us ready for glory. Would you say amen? Now, beloved, this is expressly why some Christians get so discouraged and they want to quit. Because they're scarcely saved, beloved, because they don't like the pains of having to endure God's chastening hand upon them. In other words, a lot of people throw the towel and they just give right up. They say, this is too much. You know, if you're joined the service, beloved, I know in the Marine Corps that if you ever gave up, you would never give up, beloved. Let me tell you why you wouldn't. You wanted to, but the reason you didn't is because they recycle you. And I'd rather go through Vietnam seven more times than go through Paris Island again. <laughs> okay. They make it a living hell on this earth, so you can't uh, give up. You don't want to throw the towel in. And the painful chastening hand of God, that paedia, that uh, child training, beloved, sometimes I tell you he does it with blessings, other times he does it with painful things, even when we're not sitting, because he's trying to develop us, amen? So we need to understand that. And so what I'm saying to you, beloved, we're not for God being the divine Lord and overlord in our life and daily intervening, daily getting involved in what we say and do. We'd never be sanctified holy. We'd never be finally and fully saved. And we'd never be able to receive that spiritual inheritance, of course, that he's laid up for us in heaven. So thank God, thank God that he watches out for our souls and our salvation like that. So, beloved, throughout this epistle, Peter starts doing some things. He starts showing us how to deal with the things that we're going to encounter as Christians. Now, remember, these people were persecuted brethren. They were under the, the Neronian persecution, and Nero was a maniac. Remember, he burned Rome down to try to blame it on the Christians. But they're undergoing persecutions here because Peter's showing us that we're, we too are going to undergo it. We know that the most persecuted people in the world today, statistically, we know that. It's a fact. Are Christians all over the world. And that's why we need to pray for one another, amen? And if you don't pray for your persecuted brethren, beloved, and you get locked up sometime, you're going to wish that you did because they may not pray for you. So you need to pray. And you can read that in Hebrews 13, 3, but I want to move right along, uh, beloved, as we do this. So what does Peter do? He tries to strengthen our faith, our commitment to God. He tries to strengthen our salvation, beloved, so we don't and won't get discouraged and we will not quit. So what he does throughout this epistle is he tries to exhort, he tries to edify, he tries to encourage and teach and help us about how to deal with some of the primary things that we're all going to encounter in the spiritual battle that God is going to use in our life to spiritually mature us. Peter says in 2 Peter 3, 18, he says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever. Amen. He didn't say grown in disgrace. Grow in grace. And growing sometimes, beloved, takes a lot of things. You've got to water it. You've got to fertilize it. You've got to do a lot of things to have a plant grow. Come on and say amen out there. And so, beloved, he, uh, Peter's showing us that if the righteous scarcely be saved, then they're going to have to deal with some things. So, that'll kind of bring you up to snuff what we talked about last week. 
First thing he shows us is how to deal with sin. Not too many preach, people preach about sin today. Sin is a transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4, we know that. But I want you to see what he says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Peter says, For as much then as Christ had suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that had suffered in the flesh had ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. Now, folks, when we come to Christ, we are now in a state of saving and sanctifying grace uh, with God. But God knows, beloved, that we're still going to struggle with sin. And he also knows that sin is still a danger in our life. Now, a lot of Christians think if a Christian sins, he doesn't get the chastening like an unsaved person does. But God does not make that distinction in the Bible. That's purely a man-made doctrine, so we want to forget about that, throw it out the window. Amen? So, beloved, he knows we're going to, uh, this sin can still endanger our soul if we let it. Yet God, by the supernatural power of indwelling spirit and grace, expects us to do something. He expects us to fight the good fight of faith so that we may lay hold on eternal life. You hear that? That's 1 Timothy 6.12. Fight the good fight of faith that you may lay hold on eternal life. In other words, beloved, he expects us to strive to try and get victory over sin, whatever it may be in our life, so we don't get condemned with the world. Amen? So, beloved, if we don't do that, in other words, if we refuse to deal with them, then we can be most assured that God, even though God is merciful, even though God is patient with us, even though God is loving and long-suffering with us, beloved, he will then immediately step in and chasten us so we can overcome them and lest they overcome and they destroy and they damn us. We can't, God cannot allow us to have sin in our life and tolerate with it and live in it and play with it. He can't do it. That's contrary to everything God stands for. God utterly hates sin. It took the death of his son to be able to forgive us for it. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, as you're looking at this test, I want you to notice that this determination to overcome our besetting sins begins with a consecrated mind. It begins with a what? Consecrated mind. Look what he says in verse number one. For as much then as Christ had suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind as Christ. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So, beloved, we're to arm ourselves, hope leads o humais. That is, we're to now gear up, gird up the loins of our mind so that it's dedicated, so that it's devoted, so that it's determined to indeed overcome all sin in our life and not tolerate it or indulge it. Left to ourselves, we just say, well, no big deal. God says it is a big deal because it's preventing you from growing in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen? So, beloved, to enable uh, us to do it, Peter says that we first have to have that consecrated mind. We have to have the same type of mind of Christ or the same model of mind of Christ, the same mindset of Christ that's so fixed and focused on our salvation that it's willing to suffer, that it's willing to fight against and conquer the seductive allurements and temptations of sin like he did for us. Amen? You see, beloved, having this kind of sanctified mindset empowered by God now enables us to want to keep his commandments. You want to do it and not break God's law, beloved, and also to make it now a habitual practice in our life to be able to do the will of God just like Christ did. But it began with a consecrated mind. Why, beloved? He says here so we can cease from sin. Pao hamartia. Meaning, we can resist, we can reject, we can overcome sin like he did for us in the flesh. Now listen to me. Christ kept his mind fixed and focused on pleasing God. Do you? Christ kept his mind fixed and fo focused on living a holy, righteous, and godly life. Do you? Christ kept his mind fixed and focused on obeying God's commandments and doing his word, will, and ways. He kept his mind fixed and focused on denying and dying to self, mortifying and crucifying the flesh. Do you do that? 
Christ kept his mind fixed and focused on redemption and salvation, beloved, to finish the work that God had sent him to do. So we need to learn how to do that. Amen? And that begins with a consecrated mind. A mind that's so fixed, so focused, like a laser beam on what we're doing because nothing in this world should be more important to us than our salvation. Amen? Now, beloved, the Bible says in Colossians 3, 1 through 4, this is what it says. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things of this earth. Why? For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. For when Christ was our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Amen? That's Colossians 3, 4. Paul's talking to the church at Coloss, to the Christians at Coloss. So, beloved, what's your mind... I ask you today, what is your mind daily fixed and focused on? The things of this world? I hope not. Beloved, do you have a spiritual or a sensual mindset? Do you have a carnal or a consecrated mindset? Do you have a worshipful or worldly mindset, beloved? What is it? What is always going across your mind? Does God go across your mind all the time? Does pleasing Christ go across your mind all the time? Does honoring Christ and the Lord and obeying, does that go across your mind all the time? I hope it does. It ought to, for all of us Christians, amen? That's a consecrated mind. That's the same mind that Christ had. Excuse me. Now, in Philippians 2, 5, Paul says this. He says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Now, the word let there is the Greek word phrenao. And it's a present tense verb. And it means to permit, allow. In other words, always allow, always permit God's mind, Christ's mind to be in you. Because the Bible says we have the mind of Christ. But if you don't keep focused on Christ, you won't have the mind of Christ. So he says, let this mind be in you, which was also Christ Jesus, who being the form of God. I won't go and correct the rest of you, okay? That's the kenosis. But he says, let this mind be in you. So you have to do it. So many are scarcely saved, beloved, because they have the wrong mindset. In other words, they're thinking about the right things. Oh, listen to me, beloved. Christ did not fix and focus his mind on worldly things, and neither should we. Christ did not fix and focus his mind on carnal or material things, and neither should we. Christ did not fix and focus his mind on fleshy things, or selfish things, or sinful things, and neither should we. If you do that, you're focusing on what Satan, the god of this evil world system, wants you to think about. And this whole evil world system, beloved, is utterly doomed and damned in the sight of God right now. So God, uh, Peter's showing us, God wants us to learn how to deal with sin so we can get victory over it because he wants us to finish uh, and cross that finish line. Would you say amen? The problem is the righteous sometimes drop their weapons. In other words, beloved, they drop their God. They don't put on the whole armor of God to fight the good fight of faith. And when that happens, then what? Satan the, is right there. His demons are right there, beloved. The enemy of our souls. What he does as he comes to now inundate and overwhelm our minds with evil thoughts, evil temptations to sin. See, because we're thinking about worldly things, so he says, you're thinking about worldly things? I'll take care of you. He watches, uh, the demons see what you watch. They listen to how you speak. They see your life, what you're going to do. And so they know exactly where to tickle us, amen? So we'll do those things. So, beloved, God knows this. And because God knows this, He knows that sin is a liar. Sin is a cheat. Sin is a deceiver. Sin is a destroyer. Sin is a killer and a damner of men's souls. And when the righteous now uh, start living in sin again, beloved, God immediately steps in to stop and correct and protect them if they don't repent of it themselves. Remember, if we judge ourselves, the Bible says we will not be judged. Amen? In other words, if I backslide and I say, gee, Lord, I see the conviction of the Holy Spirit in my life. I know that what I'm doing is wrong. I repent of it. Uh, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If I do that, God steps in and he says, fine. But if I don't, then, beloved, he's going to show me how to stop that. Amen? You see, his chastening hand goes to work to judge us, 
to afflict us, to punish us if we need it, beloved, to take us out to the woodshed. Why? Because he wants us to repent. He wants us to reform our ways. He wants us to get on track and stay on track for heaven. Now, beloved, God doesn't want us corrupted and controlled uh, by sin again. And that's what happens when you play with it. I, as a minister, as a Christian, have seen many Christians think that they've got to reach, they reach a level of spirituality and they think they can go back into the world. Now they get victory over this because they know all this and get entrapped in the same things they used to be, be in. Same sins. So God does not want us corrupted and controlled by sin again. He doesn't want us deceived by sin again. God does not want us destroyed and damned by sin again. So if our Heavenly Father didn't step in with His paternal hand of chastening and deal with us, beloved, then we would be damned. We would be corrupted by sin. So God is always watching over us as our divine Lord and overlord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And pass the bullets. Amen. I'm so thankful God's got my back. You see, beloved, but that's why the righteous are scarcely saved. Sin can still be a danger to our soul in this life. It doesn't mean when you got saved that now you can go out and sin and not be dealt with by God, which a lot of Christians are teaching today, and I told you, because of that demonic, diabolical doctrine from Satan, once saved, always saved. It absolutely destroys many of the warnings that the Scripture warned God's people about. Just ask Adam and Eve. They were the first ones to fall for it, Amen. Look what happened then. But you see, beloved, we're not, we're not for the constant and the continuous divine intervention of God's chastening hand when we sin to get us to repent, to get us to quit the besetting sins, beloved. He knows it left to ourselves and ultimately we would commit spiritual suicide. We keep on keeping on doing exactly what we are doing, thinking that the hand of God's blessing is upon us when we're living in sin, and so therefore we drift right off into the lake of fire, and God doesn't want that. I told you last week, if you can live in sin as a Christian and not be dealt with by God, you had better check your salvation, amen? And if you're always feeling miserable, beloved, because you're in sin, praise the Lord, that conviction is of the Holy Spirit, and that's a testimony or a witness to you that you are sin. So the righteous are scarcely saved without God's daily oversight in their life, without their the divine uh, intervention in their life, and without God's divine chastening in their life. So, beloved, our minds need to be supernaturally illuminated and enlightened by the Spirit and grace of God, by the word, will, and ways of God, by the moral and spiritual principles of God. Now you hear me what I'm about to say. And not by the world. And not by TV. And not by social media. And not by cell phones. And not by conservative talk uh, shows uh, or talk show hosts. You know, beloved, we know that there's a lot wrong in this world. Amen. And we should expect it because God wants us in Scripture it's going to be like that. But these talk show hosts, though you may agree with them and I may agree with them, they get you so fired up and the bottom line is there's nothing we can do about it. The government, I mean, what's going on in our government right now, beloved? They're saying this is wrong, that wrong, and it is wrong. And you, believe me, I told my wife, I said, if they elected me president, I said the second day they lynch me. But the bottom line is it gets you all fired up. And you're fired up for the wrong things. Because this world is not your home. You see, beloved, Satan's a wily foe, and he knows how to deceive us with good things. And so, beloved, God wants us, our minds, filled with the things of God. Why? So he says here, so we can cease from sin. And those who arm themselves with the same mind of Christ, they have this moral and spiritual victory in their life. They have this peace, this calmness, this tranquility of soul in their lives. Why is that, Pastor? Because they have that internal inner witness of the Holy Spirit that they're indeed a child of God. Amen. The things are right on the vertical with them. And that's the Holy Spirit's job in our life, and we're thankful for that. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying why? Why is this true that we have this tranquility? Because now, beloved, we truly love what Christ loves. We truly desire what Christ desires. We truly want what Christ wants. 
I've told you again and again over the years, it's not a daily increase in your life, it's a daily decrease. It's not an adding to, adding to, adding to. It's getting rid of, getting rid of, getting rid of until you get down to the bare essentials, until you get down to the nitty gritty, if you will. Not a daily adding to. And so, beloved, when the righteous do that, this draws them nearer to God and it leads them to totally surrender themselves more fully to the person of God and to the power and control and governance of the Holy Spirit. That's why James chapter 4 verse 8 says this, it says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Now that word draw there is a verb. Keep on drawing nigh to God and he'll keep doing what to you. He'll keep drawing nigh to you. But beloved, if you don't have the same mind of Christ, then you, if the world is what's filling your mind, you're not drawing nigh to God. You're drawing nigh to the God of this evil world system. And so, beloved, we need the mindset like the Lord. Come on and say amen. Now, having this mindset of Christ, beloved, causes us to abandon sin as a way of life. Not only that, it also causes us to avoid the punitive chastening hand of God upon us, and it now brings down God's uh, superabundant blessings, benefits, and bounties from heaven upon us, beloved, because he sees that we are living a sanctified, holy, and holy life. I mean a sanctified, holy, that's capital H-O-L-Y, and holy, that's a capital W-H-O-L-L-Y. In other words, he sees that you're being sanctified through and through, amen? He sees that you're being sanctified in every area and aspect of your life. That's what it means to be sanctified holy and sanctified holy. I didn't really stutter out there, okay? Why? Because God now sees that we've turned our back on sin, that we've turned our back on the flesh and this evil world system. God now sees that we've turned our back on the devil. So he doesn't have to break forth and do these things in our life that can uh, chasten us, to bring us back, beloved, because he sees that through his power, his grace, his spirit, we're already doing it. Amen? That's being sanctified holy and holy. And so, beloved, now by the supernatural power of God's spirit and grace, we're able to live and follow in the footsteps of our master, the master of the Lord Jesus Christ, and have personally assumed his righteous and holy character, beloved, his convictions in our life, his conduct. And, beloved, I want to tell you something. The righteous can make mistakes, and they occasionally do. They sin, but when they do it, they utterly hate it. Because they don't want to displease their master. So they recover themselves from the snare of the devil. And confess that sin and get on with God. Amen. And so, beloved, they suffer in the flesh. Why? Because they want to cease from sin. Now, doing this, I can tell you this, is no easy task. But it is indeed a necessary one. In other words, beloved, it takes real commitment by the righteous to do this. It takes real devotion by the righteous to do this. It takes real determination by the righteous to do this or risk being lost once again. And Peter says the scarcely, that we're scarcely saved and not easily saved, beloved, because a lot of people stop striving and struggling against the besetting sins in their life. They just throw the towel in. Oh, whatever happens, happens. Beloved, you can't have that attitude. And that's what Peter threw out. Read the epistle today. Read both epistles. Peter's trying to show us what not to do. So I'm saying trying to cease from them, sin, beloved, for the righteous now becomes a way of life for them. It now becomes their habitual practice and regular routine. So as it says in verse number one, they've now suffered in the flesh. How? By daily fighting against sin like this. They've now suffered in the flesh. How? By daily uh, uh, resisting and conquering the temptations that come into their life. They've now suffered in the flesh. How? By now trying to overcome these sins in their life. You can see the struggle. You can see the battle that's going on in our lives. Amen? And a lot of people are at ease in Zion. They're not fighting against that, beloved. And that's what I told you last week. Paul warns that those who have bad works would hear stubble will be saved, yet so as by fire, by the skin of their teeth. Imagine standing before God, having no crowns to throw at his feet, getting no rewards, and he pours out his grace, his spirit upon you. And some will just 
backslide and keep doing that and you'll be saying, praise the Lord, hallelujah, glory to God. And they got the talk, but they don't walk the walk. You know, my Bible says in Hebrews 12, 4, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying this, that someday we may have to strive against sin like that. Amen? And he's using it in the context of Jesus strove against sin in the Garden of Gethsemane, beloved, because he, he wanted uh, his... His commission by God was to fulfill that redemptive mission to save you and I. And he's hematosis, or drosis, I think it is, sweating great drops of blood because the blood vessel is so dilated as he's fighting it, as he's fighting, beloved. And God says, we may have to do that sometime. So, what am I saying to you? I'm saying, number one, we have to learn how to deal with sin. Number two, we have to learn how to deal with self. Dealing with the flesh. I want you to look at 1 Peter 2.11. Peter says, having your conversation or your conduct honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they should behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. That's verse 12. Back up to verse number 11. Okay. He says, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Notice what he says here, beloved. That all Christians are strangers. We are pilgrims on this earth. This earth is not our permanent residence. Amen? We are like foreigners, exiles who temporarily live in a strange land. And just as the song says, beloved, we sing it. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up. Somewhere beyond the blue, the angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't be at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, I know there is no one like you. I'll keep singing for you. You want me to? You see, this world is not our home. And a lot of Christians are living in it. It is their permanent, permanent home. He says, we're but strangers. We're but pilgrims. We're foreigners. We're exiles on this earth right now. Why? Because our permanent home, our ultimate dwelling place is in heaven, in the eternal kingdom of God. And we're just passing through this earth. Amen? And so, beloved, we're not to adopt or follow the ways of the world or the standards of the world. We're not to adopt or follow the values in the morals and the philosophies of the world or the practices of the world, beloved, because they're evil. And they can be very sinful and deadly, spiritually speaking. And so most... Uh, of these standards or values or practices, and you see it on TV, uh, you can't escape it anywhere, are so immoral, they're so depraved, they're so degenerate, they're so idolatrous, beloved, that they are summarily condemned by God. When God sent the children of Israel into the land of Canaan, he said that they were so depraved, so moral, immoral, that the land literally vomited them out. And God says, I'm going to send you in and there were seven nations there. God says, I want you to kill every man, every woman, every child. Now, I'll confess to you, I don't know if I could kill a baby. I won't share what I, something. I, I don't know if I could go in and start stabbing children and everything. But God says, that's how corrupt. Because they passed it on not only to the, their spouse, they passed it on to their children. And if you don't stop this, it's going to go on to their grandchildren and uh, ad infinitum. So God says, I want you to go in and utterly destroy them. Kill them all. And that's uh, how General Joshua could do that. He's more of a man than I am. I couldn't tell you that, beloved. But that's what God told him to do. Amen? And you know that's true. So I'm, what am I saying to you, beloved? I'm saying this, that Christians are just passing through this abysmally dark, doomed, and damned evil world system that lusts after the flesh, that lusts after sex, lusts after homosexuality, lusts after lesbianism, lusts after transgenderism, it lusts after this uh, um, gender dysphoria, it lusts after so many different things, beloved, immorality and pleasure, it lusts after drugs and drunkenness and sinful and evil things, and it lusts after always pleasing themselves, not pleasing God. That's how selfish we become without God on this earth. We always want to please ourselves. Amen? You see, beloved, what are you saying to me? I'm saying 
the sinful fallen hearts of these people in this world always yearns and burns to flagrantly titillate the flesh, to flagrantly satisfy and gratify the flesh, to flagrantly please the flesh, beloved, no matter how evil it is, no matter how wicked it is, or disgusting or depraved or degenerate it may be. Therefore, God does not want us to do that. He doesn't want us to be contaminated by the world or dirtied or polluted by the world again. He utterly hates that. He says, and if they don't repent, these corrupted people from sin, I will summarily condemn them to the lake of fire in the end. And he doesn't want us to have that, amen? So we can't go back and play with the world. You know, so many, uh, I told you when I was on vacation, I could not watch what so-called Christian TV. I, I'm, I'm amazed what we've fallen for because most Christians don't have a clue what the scriptures really say. As long as somebody comes out and says, oh, I believe in Jesus, whatever, they think, well, he's got to be a Christian. The Bible says there's another Jesus, another gospel, and there's another Holy Spirit, Amen. So you better know, be able to discern. We shove our brains so many times because we listen to people say things and it sounds so good, but yet it contradicts Scripture. And so, beloved, God says to us, as strangers and pilgrims on earth, God says, I want you to abstain from epikomai. That is totally shun, reject, refrain ourselves from these sinful, and notice what he says there, fleshly lusts, sakikos epithumia. These carnal, depraved, and degenerate, fleshy things. Why? Because indulging in these unbridled things, these lusts, these passions, these desires, beloved, he says here literally, stratuo, they war against the soul. That means they attack the soul. It means that they battle against the soul. It means that they fight against the soul, and it's a military term. It means like military combatants do against an enemy to try to defeat and destroy them, beloved. I'm saying that this is a spiritual battle. It is total war that gives no quarter. Therefore, God does not want us chasing after the things of the world again, lest we be condemned to the world. James 4.4 4 says this. It says, whosoever is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. 1 John uh, 2, uh, verses 15 through 17, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God, he that doeth the will of God, abideth forever. So the Lord can be any more clearer than that. You know, beloved, I always hate it when people try to argue with me from silence. I was talking with someone that was dealing with uh, bestiality, right? And they said, well, Jesus never mentioned about bestiality. I said, he mentioned it all through the Old Testament. And it's the same Jesus. The Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus and God incarnate in the New Testament in Jesus, right? So he doesn't keep repeating himself. We already know what, whatever is moral, beloved, if something's moral, it means it's eternally moral. It's eternally right. You can't change it. So whatever was right in the Old Testament is right in the New Testament, right? 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 Right. You won't say right here. Right? There you go. Now you're talking. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? Paul says this because he understands this struggle between the flesh and the spirit. He says in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, he both exhorts us and he warns us, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and the two are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. In other words, you're saying, I want to please God, I want to be holy, I want to be righteous, I want to be mature, but, you know, I love the world, whatever. See, your flesh and your spirit are what? They're contrary to one, they're fighting one another. And so you'll never grow, you'll groan in disgrace, not grow in grace, Amen. So Paul goes on in that passage of scripture in Galatians chapter 5. You may want to read that this afternoon. He goes on and he lists some of the fleshly lusts there. And he warns that those who do such things, he says, will not inherit the kingdom of God. And beloved, he's talking to Christians, not the unsaved. He's talking to the churches at Galatia. Would you say amen? So beloved, this is a perpetual warfare between the flesh and the spirit. And so we must not allow ourselves to indulge or wallow or pleasure ourselves with these things lest they morally and spiritually defile and destroy us. 
and may rob that longing in our heart, that love and life of God in our soul away from us. When I got saved, beloved, I mean to this day, to the glory of God, and I started reading this book, I couldn't put it down. I couldn't even finish my, my PhD. I, and my wife, she's right here, she'd tell you, she said, Joe, but you gotta go. I said, Ellie, I can't, I can't. This, this, this means more. This is eternity we're talking about here. Of course, it took that backslide three and a half years to get saved by my own again. <laughs> but it's, under, it, it, it's hard for an unsaved person to understand that kind of a commitment, amen? But when you have the Spirit of God inside you, beloved, and you, you, you know you've got a calling on your life, this is what you want all the time. This is your food. If you don't eat that food, whatever you eat, you must digest and then assimilate. And how we grow as a Christian is by digesting and assimilating the Word of God in our life. And so I want to understand. Now, I don't understand everything I always say when I study the book of Revelation, it says those who read this book will have a great blessing. And I say with plenty of guessing. <laughs> well, but ideologically, beloved, the book of Revelation is clear. But the, there's things there that we, we're just not privy to because we don't live in that kind of a society today. And so we don't understand the symbols fully. But hear me now, beloved. One of the fruits of the Spirit that God has given us is temperance. It's self-control. Amen. And God gives those to us so we can discipline our minds, our bodies, our soul, our spirit. Fleshly lusts hurt and hamper and hinder both the life and the growth and the desires of the soul and will ultimately corrupt and condemn us, beloved, if we do not repent and forsake those things. So the righteous not easily saved because they must have become these fleshly lusts. And if they don't, God is going to deal with them in their lives. And beloved, doing this is a constant and continuous battle. That's why Paul says in Romans 13, 14, listen to what he says. He says, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Keep on putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, make no provision, not some. What does he say? No provision for the flesh. In Matthew 5, 29, Jesus warned this. He said, if your eye offends you, Pluck it out. Cast it out of your body. He says, it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be cast into hell in that day. Amen? Now, he's not really telling us to mutilate ourselves, but he's showing us how serious it is if our eyes keep focusing on fleshy things in this world. He says, cut off your hand if you have to. Pluck out your eyes. And so we can understand the metaphor, can't we? And so what am I saying to you? I'm saying this, beloved. Being sanctified holy is mandatory in our life, isn't it? It's not something that's optional, beloved, if we want to be saved in the end. You know, beloved, the righteous are scarcely saved because they must abstain from all the fleshy sins in this world. The righteous are scarcely saved because they must reject all the fleshy sins of this world. They're always being tempted, amen? We must do it. I've done it many times. No, sir, I will turn my back. I'm not even going to look at this. I'm not going to entertain it. I'm not going to let it cross my mind. I won't do it because I know where it will lead me. And the righteous are scarcely saved because they must fight against and overcome these fleshly lusts that war against the soul. They literally war against the soul. Colossians 3, 5 says, Mortify therefore your members which were upon the earth. He didn't say titillate them, did he? He didn't say, he said, mortify him. What does it mean, mortify him? And then he said, crucify him. Crucifixion means death. Mortification means death. And yet we're so enamored with the world. And this is, beloved, if you read anything about prophecy, God warns this is exactly what will happen in the last days. When the Son of Man comes to earth, will he find the faith? Well, he'll find some, because the gates of hell can't prevail against the church. But he won't find much of that true apostolic faith anymore that prays through, that lives holy. Because there's a great apostasy that he warns us about. You know, Paul said to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, he says, I beseech thee therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And he says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and holy and acceptable will of God. Amen? 
See, it's a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice. And I've told you the problem with living sacrifices many times is when they get on the altar, they crawl off it. Oh, Lord, I want to dedicate myself to you. But, oh, this is getting a little too tough. So they crawl off again like a crab. Ooh. So, beloved, what have I said to you? We had to learn how to deal with uh, sin, self, number three, suffering. Have to learn how to deal with suffering. I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. Just drop right down a little bit. Peter says, For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your fault you take it patiently? In other words, you did wrong and you deserved it and you know it, so you take it. But if when you do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with, with God. For even here unto where ye call, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. You know, in 2 Timothy 2.12, it says this, If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. Amen? So suffering for Christ is going to be inescapable for you. And beloved, I'm saying this suffering is one of those preconditions of final salvation. You don't have the luxury of being what the early church called the lapses. When the early church went under persecution by the Romans, what happened was, because they were being uh, crucified by the Romans, they were being fed the lions by the Romans, they were being thrown into the arena by the Romans, they were being burned at the stake by the Romans. So the church, Christian church called them lapses. What did they call them? Lapsy. They are lapse in their faith. And so they ran away until the persecution went over because there was ten persecutions. I don't have time to really go into it. Ten emperor, uh, empire-wide persecutions, but there were many local ones uh, that went on. But what happened after the persecution, when they came back, they said, well, we want to go to heaven. We want to come, we want to come back to church. And the churches and the pastors and the people didn't trust them anymore because as soon as their feet got put in the fire, they ran away. And so Peter said, I mean, uh, Paul says, if we suffer with him, then we shall reign with him. Amen? Now notice that in your text, beloved, the word suffering wrongfully. Pasho ardikos. It means to experience and endure unfair, unjust, undeserved physical, emotional, and mental misery, sorrow, and agonizing pain of soul and spirit, just like Jesus did for us, beloved, because he was unjustly persecuted. Amen? He did no sin. He was wholly harmless, undefiled, separate from sin, and made higher than the heavens. And yet, he suffered. And he left us an example of how we're to do it. Would you say amen? He's our sovereign and same example to follow on how we ought to learn to suffer wrongfully, beloved, because we're going to be suffering unjust things and undeserved things, all kinds of undeserved persecution like he did. I was reading last night in Pakistan. In Pakistan right now, the Muslims have, are not only burning the Christian churches, they're killing the Christians, they're stealing all of the goods from their house, they're taking over their houses. And yet, you know, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 12 that the church, the real church of God, flees into the wilderness, and that's what these Christians have to do. And it's coming here. Because the Bible warns us in Revelation chapter 6, there's much martyrdom yet to come, and it does in Revelation 13. Amen? So you say, Pastor Joel, how come you're not preaching like some of these other guys on TV? Because I'm a real preacher. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you what the Bible says. Not make you feel good. If you feel good, hallelujah. I get a little Gucci goo every now and then. You see, beloved, Jesus said this. He warns us that suffering as a Christian comes with the territory. He says, if they hated me without a cause, they will hate you without a cause. Amen? So they hate us because of the God we worship. They hate us because of the Lord Jesus Christ we follow as being the only way to heaven. They say it's too narrow, but Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You can't get to me through Buddha. You can't get to me through Muhammad. You can't get to me through Moses. You have to go to heaven. You, if you want to go to heaven, you've got to go through me. Now, he either lied or he told us the truth. I believe he told us the truth. How about you? 
And so the world hates us, beloved, because of the convicting word and message and gospel we preach that cuts us to the core. I've had people write me before, how, how dare you say that? And I, say, sh- I always say to them, show me where I'm wrong. And they can't do that, brother, but I, I don't say that because I'm anything great. But see, they're not talking biblically, they're talking emotionally to me. Because whatever I said scratched them right where it itched, and it convicted them. And when you're convicted, it requires that you make a change. You've got to do something, amen, about it. And so that's what it is. So I understand this. So I don't get mad at all. I just want to kill you. No, excuse me. And beloved, they hate us because of the holy, righteous, and testimony we live. And they hate us because we're the moral and spiritual conscience and compass of the world that convicts their conscience and makes them feel guilty of their sins and their iniquities, beloved, and their idolatry and their degenerate immorality in this world. You see, beloved, they don't want to hear about pro-life, you know, abortion. I mean, that's a lady's right, isn't it, to have abortion? No, it's your right. If you want to fornicate, then take precaution, because as soon as you do that, if you don't do that, there's another life in you. And you have no right to take that life. And God warns that if you do that, he'll take your life if you don't repent of it. And so, beloved, the world unjustly condemns us. It unjustly persecutes us. It will unjustly mistreat us. And it definitely does murder and martyr us. Amen? And naturally, beloved, listen to me. Our flesh hates their abuse and their unfairness. Our flesh, I know it does with me, the injustice of it all, because you know it's wrong. We hate the inequity, the harming and hurtful things that they say, beloved. And we've done them no wrong, yet they're doing that to us. Why? Because they're trying to defend their immoral actions. You see, beloved, our natural instinct is to retaliate in kind, isn't it? You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> I was shaving the other day, and I was thinking about that rich guy, that Hollywood producer, waking up with his prime horse's head, <laughs> race horse's head, in his bed that went, ah! <laughs> right. God going to make you an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> And our natural instinct, beloved, is to respond in kind, to react in kind. In other words, we want to strike back, don't we? We not only want to get even, we want to get one up. That's the way I was before I became a Christian. Someone did something to me, fee fi fo fum I spent the blood of an Englishman. You hit me once, I hit you twice. Not anymore. Now I'm a marshmallow. <laughs> But, beloved, we know that to do this, to submit like Christ when we suffer, beloved, if we don't do that, it's sin in our life, isn't it? And it's disobedience, and it's unchristlike, and it's wrong, beloved. We're not suffering rightfully if we retaliate in kind. We're suffering wrongfully, aren't we? And, beloved, that's not what Christ wants. He says in verse number 19 that that's not thankworthy. Not only not thankworthy before God, but not thankworthy in our conscience because God will convict us of it if we're a Christian. You know, when the apostles were arrested and jailed and beaten, beloved, the Bible says that when they were released, they came out and they glorified God, that they were counted worthy by God to suffer shame and blame for his name. They beat them, beloved, and I don't even want to explain to you, because the kids are here, what they do when they lay your back open and you're, go right through your skin and your muscles, and I won't go into that. But the important, they said that we count it worthy. God allowed us to do this for his name's sake. In other words, it's the least we can do for him in light of what he did for us. And so, beloved, the righteous are scarcely saved because we must learn to do that. You see, suffering wrongfully is not natural, but it's supernatural. It's not easy. It's hard. And it's certainly not normal, it's abnormal, amen? Our not doing this, beloved, is going to disparage and dishonor Christ. It's going to ruin our witness and our testimony. It's going to uh, uh, be, uh, uh, it will be dealt with by God in our life, I should say. Look at 1 Peter 3.16, beloved. He says, having a good conscience, a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed, they falsely accuse your good conversation. 
In other, suffering, in other words, suffering wrongfully, both by and before the unsaved, will bring shame and silence to every false accuser in our life because they cannot prove it. Amen? I remember years ago, I was home with my wife. I was laying on the floor, and she was rubbing my hair. I love it when people rub your hair. Right? Now I just take the wig off and let her hold it in her hands, and she goes like that. And a woman called, you know I'm out with your husband tonight. Oh, really? He's such a handsome guy. He is? No, that's what Ellie said. He is? No. <laughs> but you know, I was home. I wasn't doing any of those things, but people will do anything to stir up trouble. And that's what they try to do today. In politics, you take a handful of spaghetti, you throw it against the wall. That's what the recall laws are about. If you've got 50 people that work for you, you throw something against the wall, and if something sticks, then maybe the ninth guy that works for you and the eleventh guy that works for you and the fifteenth guy that works for you will say, you know what, I don't want to go to jail, so I'll make a deal with you, and I'll testify against Trump or whoever it may be. And they'll make it up, whatever they have to, to get themselves out of jail. Oh, beloved, I could never live with myself ever doing that. G. Gordon Liddy, whether you like him or don't like him, he was a man's man. He would not betray Nixon. <laughs> good, bad, or indifferent, beloved. He had some character. He had some sand in his spine. He had some backbone. Amen? And he stood against all the thr threats. So, beloved, we're not easily saved. Why? Because we must learn to suffer wrongfully for Christ's sake and for conscience sake and for Christianity's sake. Now, let me end with one last thing. That was point number three. My time ran out, but I, you know, I know you want me to finish this, right? How many brought you lunch today? The fourth thing that Peter wants us to deal with is Satan. It's who? I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter 5. And look what he says in verses 8 and 9. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now notice what he says, whom resists steadfast in the faith. Why should I do that? He says, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Christians everywhere experience the same thing. Now Satan wants you to think that your suffering is unique. Right? Nobody suffers like I do. God says it's common amongst all God's people. Now listen to me, beloved. I want you to notice here both the warning and the exhortation reminding us that the Christian is in a constant and continuous spiritual battle against a very ruthless and powerful foe. So he says, be sober. Nepho, be sober-minded, be sensible, be level-headed. Then he says, be vigilant. In other words, Gregorio. That is, take heed, be awake, alert, always on guard for the sudden attacks by Satan, the devil, Satan, the adversary of your soul, Satan, the tempter of your soul, Satan, the deceiver of your soul. Always being awake. Oh, I'm always asking the Lord, is this of you, Lord? I'm trying to discern things. Did you put this person on my path or not put this person on my path? And if they did, what is it I need to learn? And give me the heart so I can learn it. So I, don't, I can drop that wall that's inside me. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying because he utterly hates us. And notice Peter says he seeks to devour, catapino, that is to totally consume and destroy our souls, so he roams about like a rapacious, honey, hungry lion, stalks and kills and devours his unwary prey. That, that deer, I was watching uh, as I was closing my, my uh, preparing my sermon for today, as I was getting ready to close my computer, that showed a a leopard stalking an antelope. And so there's this antelope on one side of a tree and he's in the grass and he's nibbling away and then every now and then you look up and a leopard comes along and there was a little berm of sand and then there was a road there. You know what the leopard did? He crouched down behind the berm and he'd, crawl, he'd go three or four inches and the, the deer would look or the antelope would look around and not see anything, go down and eat and he'd crawl up a little bit more. You know what that leopard did? He went right down the road, around the tree, so it was right in front of the antelope. The antelope couldn't see him behind the tree. And when the antelope, antelope bent his head down to eat again, whoa! A leopard jumped on him right there. 
That's why we need to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary is a devil, is a roaring lion. Roams about like a rapacious lion, seeking whom he may devour. Amen? So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. He tries to do that to God's people. He wants us off our guard. He wants us. Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, those who are clean escaped. He says, if you get entangled and ensnared in your sin once again, it's better off you never even knew the word of God uh, than, than to know it and then not do it. And so that's what Satan is trying to do with God's people in these last days. 1 Timothy 4.1. For the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart to the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, demons. So we need to be awake. We need to be alert. We need to be vigilant. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying the righteous need to learn how to recognize a satanic attack. They need to learn how to resist and rebuke and fight against a satanic attack and overcome a satanic attack. And because of your time, beloved, I won't quote the scriptures to you. But in Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, I'll just give you a little smidgen. He says, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And I'll stop it right there. That's why, beloved, the Bible says in James 4, 8, Submit yourselves therefore unto God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. If you don't submit first to God and let God be the authority in your life, you've got no authority over the devil. And that's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 2, 11, that we're not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. The Bible says we are to know about the wiles of the devil. But I love what Paul said to the church of Corinth, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, he says, Thanks be unto God, who always causes us to triumph in Christ. The cross was the nemesis of Satan. The Bible says in Colossians 2, uh, 14, having spoiled, I mean 15, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. You see, beloved, we fight in victory, Amen. The war is already won, but not the spiritual battle in your life. God has given you the tools. He's given you the power. He's working in your life, but we must submit and surrender to it. We must, through faith, utilize those things. So we need to be sober. We need to be vigilant. So what are you saying to me, Pastor Joel? I'm saying simply this, beloved. These are the reasons our having to fight against and learning how to do it. Learning how to fight against self. Learning how to fight or deal with suffering in our life. Learning how to fight or deal with Satan in our life. These are some of the reasons why the righteous are scarcely saved. The battle is not over yet, is it? The battle for your soul is not over yet. When you listen to the once saved, always saved crowd, they say, that's it, it's over, done with, don't worry about it. And all you got to do, <laughs> you have to overlook a plethora of scriptures that are contrary to that. Amen? Now let me close with this. Whenever you have a doctrine and there's an irreparable breach between two sets of doctrines, one saved, always saved the conditional security. In other words, you've got a growing grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Whenever there is an irreparable breach between two sets of scriptures, how you work it out is what, what position reconciles both positions of scriptures. You see what I'm saying? If you maintain the once saved, always saved position, then you're going to look, overlook a preponderance of scriptures and you'll have to misinterpret and twist and do spiritual gymnastics and parse words to be able to maintain that doctrine. I told you I thank God for those who live above that doctrine but it's the most damnable doctrine that's ever been on the face of this earth. And it has no place in the, in the church of Christ. That's like saying to a Marine, I want you to gear up, I want you to train, 
I wanted you to go through all the headache, the heartache, all of the shooting, all the bull, all the wool, all of that. But you know, you already won the war, so you're just doing this in vain. Right? That sound reasonable? Why is Christ our still high priest? Because we still sin and we have to confess our sin. So he has to keep ministering before the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant and the heavenly sanctuary. Amen? So, beloved, I want to make point because I could just get my second wind here. <laughs> I'll probably drop right out of this. But I just want you to see how seriously we need to take the scriptures. If the righteous scarce shall be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Is what Peter says. Amen? All right, let's go to the throne of grace.